Hello and welcome to the Education on Fire podcast. The place where we share creative and inspiring learning in our schools. Season 1, Episode 4. Hello and welcome to Education on Fire. I'd like today to introduce Andrea and Seth Gardner. Um, We're going to be talking today about um, how your words um, change your world around you. Um, They've created a a, a video which has got something like um, 25 million hits now, which I'm sure they will explain a bit more about how that came about. But it really is just changing, changing the way your words work and how it changes the world around you. And Andrea's written a book called change your words, change your world. Um, and um, yes, it's an, it's an incredible story. And I think it's something as educators and teachers, we're really able to, um, to change our environment within a school with, with that, kind of, um, that kind of knowledge and insight. So welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank Good you, Mark. You, Mark. Good to be here. And um, yeah, could, could, could we start with, with, with that video, which is just such an amazing, um, an amazing feat, um, a, a viral video that's gone and so large and 25 million I think it was when I, when I when I looked the other day how did that come about and and what is it about that that you think is um really caught the public's imagination absolutely yes uh we created the power of words back in 2009 as a pitch for for a business uh called purple feather uh which is a, an online communications company um it was absolutely useless as a pitch because it's um the premise is that if you if you change your words you can change somebody else's uh world for them and it has a very emotionally impactful message and every time we showed it at our business meetings um there was silence afterwards while people kind of scurried around in their handbags looking for tissues and cleared their throats because it was it was so impactful so as a pitch it didn't work very well um, we decided to put it online back in 2010, and it uh, immediately went viral with over a million views in a weekend. And it's now climbed to something like 20, uh, it's over 25 million now, but seems to keep climbing every day. It's, it's incredible. Could you just um, explain the, the, sort of the premise of the video and, 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 and what it's actually about? Yeah, sure. Uh, The the video focuses on a blind man who's sitting in the middle of a square in Glasgow with a sign that says, um, I'm blind, please help. And a copywriter or a businesswoman comes along, looks at his sign, realises that he's not really collecting many coins from passers-by, and she decides to change his sign to something that's more heartfelt. So she changes his sign to, it's a beautiful day and I can't see it. And when she comes back later, his tin is full to overflowing and he asks what she did. And she said, well, I wrote wrote the same words, but in a a different way. So, um, you know, that's that's the message, really. You can you can change. You can still have you have have an impact with a message just by changing a few words. And for for, for me, that's that's such an um an important and, and and incredible story because um, education on fire is is being set up really in exactly that premise. Well, um, there are many of us who may um, like the system to be different and the education system to work in a different way. We are kind of where we are, and unless we're a politician or unless we're someone who can change everything overnight, which is which is obviously unrealistic. Just the whole premise of just the way we can do things within an environment we're already in. Um, can make such an impactful thing, and that's why I thought it was um, be such a great idea to to speak to you today, and um, and sort of really sort of get into what why we think that is, and 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 what it is about the way that we communicate that can make a big difference. Um, so, in terms of teaching and children and and their sort of classroom environment, um, do you think that's as will have such a big impact as well in, in terms of if a teacher is talking in one particular way and then decides to say exactly the same thing in a different way, do you think that can have a very impactful difference on them all? Absolutely. Um, I don't know about you, but as a child, I remember the teachers who made an impact on me um, more than anybody else. You know, They were the teachers who really cared about the outcomes for me and uh, you know, got to know who I was and framed their messages in such a way that, that I understood them and could take them forward in my life. 
And I was always being told as a child, you know, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. So I think that as well as the words, it's the the import behind those words. It's the, you know, it's the intention that you carry when you're communicating, particularly with young children who are who are very susceptible and very receptive to your message. Yeah, that's right. I just sorry, just come in there. I think um, what Andrew was saying is true. It's the, also the intent behind the words. And of course, using film, one of the things about film and the power of identification is it creates a, an emotional connection with its audience. And one of the challenges for any teacher is to realize that, the, you know, we have to make uh, an emotional connection with young people. And um, as we know, you can only ever be in one emotional state at any one time. And so we need to choose the emotional state that we're going to be in as we make our connection. And that obviously covers, you know, things from empathy to listening. So it actually creates some sort of limbic resonance. And what that means in sim simple terms is you actually have to be the emotional state that you want to leave the children in. So in communication terms, how do you want to leave a child feeling? Because we learn so much through our emotional connection. It's not what you say, it's not what you do, it's how you leave me feeling. And as Andrew just said, we can all, all remember that inspirational teacher. And the learning is so wonderfully connected with an emotion, a really strong emotion, I think, that uh, we, we still can recall even now, at, uh, <clears throat> many, many years afterwards. Uh, so I think there are two things that go together. I think one is the, the language that is used, you know, there is the actual emotional reality, the authentic emotional reality that connects with the communicator, in this case, usually a teacher. I'd be really interested for, for those of you listening um, to get in contact with us and, and, and leave a message or a comment um, under this podcast, because I, I, I wonder how many people when they were training and how many people when they were learning their craft actually started their their lesson plan or even the thought of their lesson with the thought how am I going to leave my class feeling at the end of it um, I'm sure a lot of it it's it, it's about making sure you get the topics covered it's making sure you've got all the boxes ticked that you have to tick for that day which is completely understandable but starting even deeper than that in terms of how am I going to impact the children and how am I going to make them feel when they leave this lesson I think is um would be such an incredible thing to have as part of your training all the way through and I'll be really interested for you to get in contact with us and just um and, and let us know if that even came into your training and if it did um how, how that how that was brought through I definitely know when um when I'm teaching drums you you often get a sense of um of where the pupil is when they enter the room and um and while you might have um an idea plan of, of where you thought that lesson was going to go because um last week you did this and you know they've got a deadline of, of an exam or something in a few weeks time unless they're in the right space when you're starting you may as well not bother with the actual sort of technical side of things and actually <laughs> a lot of a lot of yeah. my lessons often start with the kind of you know just bringing them back to where they need to be for today you know there's obviously something going on you know what what is it that's happened you know how you're feeling what is it we want to do you know what and and so in order to be able to achieve anything really sort of starting from this moment it's kind of you know where are you emotionally and um and while it, it may not be phrased as direct to that i think just actually being aware that um that that's such an important thing is um is probably something that should be in the forefront of everyone's minds as they start any given lesson yes i agree i agree mark and I, I for me my experience in uh, you know lots and lots and lots and lots of schools is that not very many people actually listen to teachers or give them the kind of emotional support that they, re they need i think and require to maintain a, a, a mindful and constant emotional state you know we all fluctuate we all have, you know, good days and bad days. We all feel, you know, tired and irritable at certain points. But if we manage to sort of mindfully uh, maintain um, uh, an emotional resonance, which is going to uh, impact positively on the on the hearts and minds of young people, then uh, we, we start to create uh, rapport. And uh, anybody that enters a classroom is already is already uh, conditioned to expect that from a teacher. It's one of the expectations as well. When you come to a movie, which is my background as a movie maker and educationalist, I'm always thinking about the audience. You know, how what are their expectations coming to the movie? What are their expect and you know how does the movie work? And then how does it leave them feeling? So I think there's a there are a couple of you know good things to think about as you were saying prior to even going into the classroom. And um. And just give us a little bit of um, of history and background um, on your sort of educational side of your of your movie making and um, 
And and how, how did the people that you've been working with um, think when you sort of brought that up as its sort of initial premise of uh, of movie making and storytelling? Well, yes. I mean, the main impact has been around communication because so many so many young people are competent they're very competent uh, a lot of the time we, we generally we think we need to focus on those that have difficulties but a lot of children do find level of competency competency but they, they lack the confidence and they lack the confidence in communication and the um the, you know the, the teachers have to uh, establish a, a good communication skills from the teaching point of view to help and then to also when i've come in a lot alongside schools to help young people then uh, find their own confidence in communication, which is things about making eye contact, about knowing how to communicate clearly and concisely. Uh, so a lot of my my work around the world has been alongside that, and sometimes working in very depressed areas in South Africa or maybe up with the Inuit in the Antarctica and stuff, where simple eye contact um, is enough to really transform uh, a learning and teaching experience. So do, do you think... Um it's it's part of the education um development is is the as people go on and and i think i think all these things are, are becoming more and more important and then, and we know mindfulness is becoming a big thing in terms of a name in school i don't really think mindfulness is a new thing i think it's something that's always been there and maybe something that we've uh, we've lost a little bit of sight of um um but i certainly anything which brings brings us all back to the moment so that we actually are just focusing specifically on what we're doing now it always has a very emotional and, and um, impact on us and, and usually engages everyone that's involved um, but do you think there should be some kind of awareness of this as part of the curriculum or do you think maybe uh, for me it's maybe as well I think maybe it should be just embedded into every lesson you know just the awareness that actually we need to be communicating in a different way so that the engagement's there automatically rather than having a separate understanding that there's communication as one side of it but then you still go and do your maths and English <laughs> as a separate thing and actually just that understanding that all these things can be embedded in, in into part of education as a whole. I absolutely agree Mark I think it is all about communication and it's not about, um, you know, a, a, a sort of a book of facts which somehow need to magically transfer, uh, you know, move across the ether and embed themselves on the brains and, and the, uh, you know, the uh, neural architecture of young people. I think it, it is a fundamental issue of communication and that requires um, emotional resilience on the behalf of teachers and, and emotional support and their training. You mentioned mindfulness as one of the ways forward and that's a, a very powerful and positive way of uh, transforming communication in classrooms. I mean, often classrooms are very noisy places and creating spaces for silence and quiet can really transform. But I just want to go to Andrew on this point because she's got some good insights on the actual communication language linguistically. Yeah, I would um, I would absolutely agree with what you've both said there. Um, it's you know it's it's storytelling is so important I think to communication generally. Um, you need to remember that particularly young children between the ages of two and twelve are largely in a theta learning state which is a hypnotic state um, if you've ever had any hypnosis yourself or you know know anything about it you'll understand that um, hypnosis is based on storytelling um, and it's it sticks in our brains so much uh, more firmly when we when we're told a story it engages a different part of our brain uh, which is closely linked to memory so we're much more likely to memorize facts and figures and um, you know, and stories if if they're linked to to a story and therefore an emotion. And c can that be a story, um, like a traditional story, um, or a fable, or um, or, or a piece of fiction? Um, or do you think it also works um, with something which is actually based in reality? And um, the, the reason I mention that is because um, one of the most successful projects um, some of my ch um, children have done. Um, so I do remember during their primary school years, they had to create their own business. Um, and so immediately the whole concept of maths and English and art all just disappeared. It all became about what business do we want to produce? How can we do it? Do we have the resources? Mm -hmm. um, we need to create um, a financial plan. We need to write the publicity. We need to draw artwork. We need to physically either build or find a way of creating a product that we can sell to the parents. Um, and we need to see if it's going to make a profit or whether it's not. Um, and so 
the story became the project and it became a reality. Um, but they were using all the yeah. skills they had from all subjects if you wanted to split them up into maths and English and art and um, DT and all those kind of things. But because it was a real life story or actually it was a real life project, um, it seemed mm -hmm. to capture their imagination in a way that I've never known anything else do before. Mm, absolutely, yeah. Uh, uh, one of the, I'm just casting my mind back to a project that we had, we were given at school, which was to create a board game during our, our maths lessons, you know, and maths to me was, was probably the dullest subject <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah. Um, but as soon as a board game was introduced, it fired up my imagination. Um, it, you know, we, we were very collaborative. We all worked as part of a team. It was great fun. We had an outcome to consider. Yeah, I think, you know, hanging, hanging that on a, on a, a tangible outcome, you can actually see the benefit of using these skills. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, I think that's sorry. I think that's one of the things about being inspirational. You know, when you ask the question, teachers must get bored of it. You know, what makes you an inspirational teacher? The use of, as you said, a business is fundamentally a narrative. It's a story. It's a way of framing the connection with learning, the way to frame the reasons that you will participate, um, you know, as part of a team and the reason there's an outcome that you go for. But inside the inspiration there has to be an emotional connection with it i think i don't know if you found that mark in what you were doing where the children got excited and emotionally connected with their business project um i think so but because i think it was real um it was because they they were basically putting their personalities into it um I'm yeah. not sure as so much they were going to be judged on it. It was more the fact that they wanted it to be their best thing because there was a competition element because they were split into groups and um, and they were sort of competing yeah. from that point of view. But I think they just wanted to do the best they could and they wanted to they wanted to create something that they wanted their parents to buy. And in order for them to buy it, it was it needed to be something which they thought they would like and so therefore they didn't have to be talked to in terms of you need to do your best work or you need to make it like this or make it like that it just became instinctual you know of course that's what you do because you're uh, you're all working together and interestingly at that point rather than everybody saying oh, I'll do the same type of things everyone really understood what their each other's talents were so so those that like the finance um. and the, 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 the sort of the math side of it actually gravitated mm. to that and were able to do that the people who really enjoyed the drawing and designing would gravitate to that and and so on and, and so there was sort of this sort of natural sense of just working out what your skills are and working together as a team and um and all, all the things that schools try and do um just just happen naturally and, and and they were given quite a lot of free reign with it really they just knew they had to create something and it had to be sold and um and they had to have a budget and try and find a way of making it work but um Yes, yeah, so I, I, th I think it was that sort of emotional sense of, you know, this is something that we can actually achieve. And, they, and also I can see the whole point mm. of it. And I can see the whole arc of it starting from just the concept of sitting around a table and, um, and discussing some ideas through exactly. to actually physically having something. And then at the end of it, having sold it, you know, um, some, some money at the, end, at the end of it as well. You know, the whole yeah. thing had a purpose, <laughs> you know. Mm. Exactly. And I think that's very interesting what you said about it having an arc because all narrative, and as a filmmaker, we know all narratives and all storytellers, you know, that every story has a narrative arc to it. And I think what also happens, I love the way you've been doing that, Mark, because within that we can find our roles and we all want to write our own stories and be the author of our own stories and find our characters within it. And so we can start to see. Uh, you know what is unique in us and see that that forms who we are and then how we work in relationship you know in relation to each other and I think that you're absolutely right I think that's all part of it you know framing um, learning in an inspirational way mm -hmm. I think I think the other thing was was the fact that, that there's a sense that you should be equally as good as everybody else in everything that you do um, and it's quite difficult in this day and age to actually just accept that you are who you are um, and that's absolutely exactly. fine. And while, while, while you, you may want to improve things or you may want to have new skills, who you are fundamentally and what you have to offer the world is, um, is, is, the, most, is the most important thing. And so that mm -hmm. sense of working together, I think, just actually changed the fact that I need to be better than you. It was much more of kind of if we combine our, combine our talents, we can be uh, a stronger force, as it were, against the uh, against the other people they were working with, and um, mm -hmm. and I, and I think that that really was a, a strong emotional feeling for them.
Mm, builds, exactly. It builds community. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. C- community, and 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 all of a sudden, you know, w- without talking about what schools are trying to achieve from a sort of an Ofsted point of view, we're, we're suddenly having buzzwords that are being thrown around all the time. And um, and and I and I love the fact that that happens. That just by sort of getting away from what you think you ought to do and just focusing on things which you feel work the best, actually, then sort of come around and give you a. And, and just gives you the results that you you probably wanted to achieve uh, in, in the first place. Mm. Absolutely, mm-hmm. absolutely. You know, I was just sorry, I was just cut across you then, but I was about to say, you know, that's where self worth comes from. You know, and one of the most powerful feelings of connection is with yourself, and you know, to value yourself, and you find that in relationship and reference to, you know, your, not only the activity to, but to your role with other people. And I think the other, I, mean, I think one of the great things as well is how you just how you're describing. Um, learning is that we all need a vision and we know we all need a dream that's something to give us a purpose to frame uh for frame it because without that you don't have a direction to to travel in and i think learning needs that framing and i think for both andrew and myself uh the communication is very very uh tightly wrapped up in the actual storytelling the story that you are telling yourself mm-hmm. and also i guess it's also down to your own story because i mean depending on on the on the age group that you're teaching um there are things that we all want to be achieving you know even if you're young you 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 might be learning an instrument or you you're you're learning a sporting activity or you have a dream of being um something when you when you grow up um and it's basically focusing on, on that passion that's the bit that tells you that I'm heading in the right direction um but yeah. with that of course yeah, we sure. all need skills you know um, that can support us in that, whether yeah. it's um, reading and writing and, and, and maths and, and those kind of things. But I think when, when mm-hmm. they become an important part of you being able to achieve something that you're wanting to achieve, I think even if it's not the most favourite thing in the world that you're learning, it, it has a purpose. And I think it then has an, a connection in a way um, that it doesn't when you're just doing it for the sake of it. Mm. Yeah, because suddenly, as you say, it becomes real. You can see your, you can find your place in the world. You can find your place in the community, and we're we're constantly telling ourselves these stories from the age of two. We, you know, this this inner dialogue begins, and it becomes unconscious by the by the age of ten, and you know we're not even often aware of the stories that we're telling ourselves as as adults, but as children. It's a very conscious process. You know, that story's going on all the time and we're testing out who we are and how we fit in. So, yeah, absolutely. I think, I think if you can see, um, see an outcome or if you can, if you can find your place in the world, uh, through the stories that you're telling yourself and then they're sort of backed up by other people, it's so powerful. And, um, and, and going sort of a bit further into that, do you think, um, for the teachers listening, um, because you don't quite know the stories that the children are telling themselves, and um, you can, I guess, you get an inkling from their personalities. Um, but you also mm-hmm. don't know what they're being told at home, and obviously that their wider environment has a big impact as well. But is there something Absolutely. generally that, um, as teachers, we can sort of reinforce in a positive way? Obviously, it needs to be geared individually to the child because everyone needs um, things in a slightly different way. But in sort of general terms, in terms of just breaking that down, if, if there's if there's a child which is obviously you get an, an inkling that they're telling a story which isn't supporting them. Is there a way of just sort of um, slightly mirroring that up so they can understand where they're going at such an early age and, and sort of change that story for themselves? Yeah, I think there are two things here. I think, you know, just letting children know that they're enough. I think that's that's one of the most powerful messages that you can deliver. And that comes through supporting them, through listening to them, through you know, really slowing down the speech, which which brings me on to point number two. If you if you slow down your speech, you start to listen more. You start to understand where somebody's coming from. It also reduces stress in the person who's speaking and in the listener, and it creates what's what's known as neural resonance, which is a kind of mirroring technique. So if the teacher can slow down their speech, quite quite dramatically you know half the the speed at which you normally normally speak your words are going to have much more of an impact on that child exactly and i think sorry sorry my god i'd add one i had one thing that to me to that sorry i think uh, and is absolutely right and you need to you know make sure that you slow down and give the pause when you said something so the brain can process it 
I also think that uh, for every child that comes into the, cl uh, the classroom, as Andrew was saying, they all have their own narrative, own story. And if you take it down to somebody, you think, well, that narrative is not clicking with everybody else. I think often we forget to sort of say the simple thing, remind ourselves that that child is just like me. That child, we are just like each other. That child just wants to feel good about themselves. That child just wants to be successful. That child does want to be okay. And that guilt often gives us the insight rather than seeing what is and making that making that stand for the child yes yeah, so you're, you're really connecting on on a on a level below the uh, below the sort of the below the story i guess it's the fundamental story rather than the um than the actual the story acting, that yeah. they're telling each other i guess that's probably not a particularly good way of, of describing it but uh, um no but, but I, know, I know what you're saying yeah i mean exactly because you know universally the universal emotions and the universal facial expressions which we need to monitor as well i mean part of good communication is to be mindful of what our face is telling people i mean when i'm training whether i'm training people to communicate in the boardroom or in the classroom it's the same thing you know are you authentically communicating that child are you consistent in your message day in day out um so that they whoever they are will feel supported and they recognize that you see in them you know that you are just like me that we all have those universal hopes and desires and often the child that is um you know is creating the most uh, mischief or mayhem or whatever is the one who wants to be there the most but uh, is 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 perhaps uh, the least able uh, to cope with the stresses that he or she feels within themselves to actually remain there and so often we just increase the um uh, the, the, the legal aspect of it, which increases the pressure and stress for that child in the first place, rather than taking the stress out of the situation by taking it out of the classroom, even if just for 60 seconds. And do, do you think that, therefore, creating an, an environment within the school um, to sort of, I don't know, a way of setting the, d the day up um, is an important way of doing that because it reinforces that as, as as an idea within your school. So you sort of have it on two levels. If if there's a situation that's obviously happening now where the child needs that 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 conversation and that attention, then that's a really important moment. But as the day starts, having a way of um of just sort of setting the tone for the whole day. That, you know, this is our class. This is our school. This is what we're about and what we're trying to do before we start to sort of move on into, into the the more academic learning side of things I mean I have heard stories of some schools sort of they do I don't know quarter of an hour or 20 minutes of dancing at the beginning of every day and it just sort of sets the whole day up in, in, in a way that it's not when it's just kind of register right pens out and, and, and away you go do you think some of those sorts of ideas are a positive way? I think the combination of intellect emotion and physicality and moving between those three states of being is important for young people and they need higher stimulation however i think what we were just talking about about you, you know some aberrant behavior where it may be the breakdown of communication and therefore teaching outcome i think it's absolutely vital that schools do that and if not um, then that uh, will trickle down to the classroom I mean, there's been great success just using simple things like a bell, you know, and the relief that happens where, we, you know, very young children especially love it. Uh, uh, you know, when you just, you know, strike the bell and say, when it happens, we'll just all become silent for 30 seconds or 60 seconds. And that silence can be massively reassuring because we've got a classroom full of introverts, a classroom with extroverts, a classroom with uh, young, uh, young people who are highly stressed and highly reactive and some who read high stimulation. And it all has to begin from that moment of uh, peace and quiet. And I think inspirational teachers recognize that and they create the spaces in the narrative and the understanding of the stories so that people can find the universal emotional access, the, the points where you can connect with the learning and then connect with your own dream and your own ideas of who you want to be and where you want to go in your life. And I think that's vital. I agree, Mark. Just to add into that, just just something that's come to mind. Um, remembering my middle school years, um, we were fortunate enough to have a, a poet as a head teacher, and we used to begin the day with him reciting poetry, but not in a very stuffy way. You know, it was it was quite fun poetry, sort of uh, <laughs> Roald Dahl esque, um, and it, it just the passion that he had for his, you know, for his topic. Um, inspired us all and I think it's you know another another part of this is perhaps for teachers 
not to be afraid to show their own creativity and their own, you know, interests. I think that can inspire children as much as as much as any words. I, th- I think that's important, and um, and you, and you're absolutely right. We 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 know that children learn from what they see and what they experience as well as, well as what they're probably more so than what they're actually sort of taught and um and so to actually see a teacher um, um speaking with their true voice like you say whatever that is whatever their passion is whatever it is that they can communicate authentic. in a way which is very authentic to them i think then speaks authentically to everybody um and um and what i love about this conversation is, as as it's gone on is the fact that we we've we've started um talking a bit more sort of in an academic style but the fundamental part of it is is that it's about the child and and child centered learning which is yeah. um interesting for me because i'm i'm part of the national council of nape the national association for primary education and child centered learning is mm-hmm. um is an important part of that and i think we've probably articulated that in a in 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 a really good way in in this that these last few minutes and the fact that in order to do anything it's um it's connecting with the child it's connecting in a way which is in encouraging in terms of fulfilling your own story and then just mm. gives you a, yeah. a safe place and an inspiring creative place for you then yes. for you yes. then to grow absolutely. absolutely and i also want to add to that i think teachers need the same support i think schools have to be an inspiring supportive place for teachers i mean so often i i don't know about you might be going to schools and teachers are really up against it and they don't think they feel valued and supported i think it needs to be um as much for teachers as well and they could benefit just as much in this kind of uh, training and how to you know how to be resilient emotionally how to be uh, to find consistency in their communication style so they can build rapport which may last more you know maybe five or six or seven years with with young people over a long learning period um i I think that's absolutely vital and and i think very would be very supportive and it's it's certainly something um which was in my mind um when education on fire became a came an idea of mine was the fact that just um great it's very very easy when you're just within a school so you have your environment and this is what you experience all the time to feel that the only th- options you have are the experience the experiences that you have within that school so you might have a supportive head you might have a yeah. supported deputy but you might be in a school where that's not the case and you can't quite see the wood for the trees yes. and you can't quite see how it's going to change and um and and part of the backstory of all this was just to ha- try and build a community to have a dialogue which was kind of no matter where you are if you're in a great environment and you're being supported let us know so that we can share it with everybody else um and if you're not come to us Brilliant. and we'll try and find a way of, of sharing what we do know already and hopefully what will grow into yeah. in, <laughs> in, into a great pool of um of supportive um things which can help you in your teaching that's Wonderful. absolutely brilliant mark yeah. fantastic great work well thank you so much for joining me on this it's been a, it's been a, a riveting conversation and um after season one we're going to be doing topic based sessions so that it'll cover lots of individual um subjects so that we can um talk more about that but um one of them is going to be wellness um, and well-being and uh, and that kind of thing. So maybe that's something we can talk about and get you back on again at a later date and and delve a bit more into the into the child and um, and how we can support them. We'd love to. Sure, you can find me at um, www.workingforwholeness.com. That's uh, where I put my educational work into. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you can also find find me on andreagardner.co.uk that's brilliant and we'll have we'll have all of those things on the show notes on the podcast as well so anything you need um go to educationonfire.com and um leave us a message and we can forward anything through if you've got any comments and we'll make sure that andrew and seth get a chance to look at all of those and um and try and support you the best we possibly can thanks very much absolute pleasure thanks mark thank you for listening to the education on fire podcast For more information, please go to educationonfire.com.